welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Thank you to the festival for hosting this very special event this evening. And uh, thank you also to the University of Edinburgh for sponsoring this event. Um, I have to admit to you, I am uh, beyond excited <laughs> right now <laughs> to be sharing a stage with a writer uh, whose work I have admired and been inspired by for a long, long time. It is a huge honour uh, for me to be speaking this evening with Chimamandi and Gozi Adichie. Let's give her a very warm welcome. <laughs> I told you there would be a good audience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Shimamanda, of course, you've been I, in Edinburgh uh, for, for the afternoon. You were awarded a, an honorary degree at Edinburgh University. Have you had a, a nice time so far? In, I have indeed. Um, but, but really, I just want to start by saying how, how, how much of a fangirl I am of Nicole. <laughs> and... I really am. And so <laughs> I'd actually decided that I wasn't going to do much travel because I'm trying to just save my time for writing. And when I was asked to, to come here, my first thought was, mm, I mean, you know, I really love this festival, but I want to write. And then Nick said, would you be willing to do an event with Nicole? And I was like, yes! <laughs> so I'm here. And <laughs> Well, thank you. I am going to dine out on that forever. <laughs> now, look, Chimamanda and I are, are both, I think it's fair to say, feminists. Yes. But, <laughs> but just to prove uh, that some of the myths about feminism are just that, myths, uh, I want to tell you a little story. When we first met each other tonight, uh, the first thing we talked about was shoes. <laughs> um, and I have to say, I've got... <laughs> huge shoe envy uh, <laughs> right now. But, but that really, I suppose, takes me on to the first thing I, I wanted to talk to you about tonight or for you to talk to the audience about tonight, which is feminism. We'll come on to talk about your fiction uh, later. You're obviously renowned for your wonderful fiction. Uh, but you've made such an impact with We Should All Be Feminists and this beautiful, beautiful book, The Letter to Your Friend, Dear Ejiowelli. Uh, the advice on bringing up her daughter uh, as a feminist. And what, what I think is so special, especially about the second one, is that it's not about the theory of yes. feminism, it's, it's about the practice of feminism. It's giving all of us advice about how to live our lives as feminists. Is that what you intended in writing the letter? Yes, and I think in some ways also it was about myself. I mean, when, when my friend asked me, I remember thinking, oh, I don't know, I mean, how would I know? <laughs> you should raise your daughter. But I, I then started to think about it. <laughs> no, but really, and I started to think about it. And, and I think also there's a part of me that takes... Um, distinct and maybe unhealthy pleasure in telling people what to do. <laughs> and so I thought this would be a good opportunity. But really, it was a map of my own thinking. And, and because for me, feminism has never been about theory. I, I didn't, I'm not a feminist because I read any of the seminal texts, um, some of which I have since read, some of which I haven't managed to finish. But <laughs> I, I became a feminist. I, I'm a feminist because I watch the world, you know, because I'm... And, and for me, feminism isn't about having arguments of theory. It's about changing the damn world. And I, I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, but real, you know, re how do we live our lives? And I hoped that it would be useful, you know, like useful just in a very practical way <laughs> for women, right? And it was, it was good for me as well, I think. When I wrote it, I wasn't a mother. Um, but now that I am, it, it's useful for me. It's, it's, I find it, um, I mean, I wouldn't change anything, I don't think. But it's, uh, yeah, I, I thought of it as a kind of, a kind of a map of my, of my own, um, what I think, what I think we should, how I think we should change the world. Because that's really in the end what it's about. Yeah, I, I love when you, you, you say that it's about teaching women and men just to be happier, yep. to be themselves. I really, because I really think, I mean, and part of what I think is, um, is lost in, the in many of the mainstream debates of feminism 
is how it's really, not just that it's about justice, mm -hmm. but that it's really about men and women being better off, happier. Because I think masculinity is, is a terrible cage for men. Right? I think that, um, that while men as a group are privileged, that even that privilege can be a cage. You know, that, that idea that men, men are raised with um, just all of these really, in my opinion, sadly constraining ideas mm -hmm. of what it means to be a man. And, and, and for me, one of the main things that feminism should do is to, to start to remake masculinity. You know, to, to, we should start to say, what is it to be masculine? Right? We should start to say, um, we should start to praise men who are vulnerable and who, who are in touch with emotions. And, and, and I also <laughs> would venture to say that if we defined, redefine masculinity, maybe certain things happening in the world wouldn't be happening. I mean, there's a sense in which that idea of masculinity that, and I'm going to say something rather crude, but in a nice way of, of, of um, men feeling the need to measure certain body parts. If we redefine masculinity, that wouldn't be part of, that wouldn't really matter anymore, you know, but. Yeah, I think that's really. <laughs> That may be, a, I don't know, a little bit challenging for some in the audience, but I, I think that's absolutely right. I, I've always believed feminism is a, as much about liberating men yes. as it is about liberating yes. women and yes. taking away all of those preconceived ideas of yep. what it means to be a man and, and what it means yep. to be a woman. Yep. What, what also struck me is it's such a beautiful, intimate letter that you're mm. writing mm. to a friend. Did you always intend to publish it? No, no, actually I didn't. And I, I made a few changes. I mean, I made sure to take out things that were too particular to her, but I, I really didn't. And so I decided to make it public. I put it up on my Facebook page because there had been debates in Nigeria about feminism and I was getting really annoyed by um, a lot of what I thought was just very retrograde thinking about, about gender. So I thought I'll put this up on my Facebook page and hopefully somebody will find it useful. And then decided to publish it. So it never was. And I, I think maybe that's why I like to think that it has, that there's an authenticity to mm. it because it's, it's real and true. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. I think everybody, uh, man and woman, should, should read it. We should give it out in schools, I think. Um, <laughs> do you think, I mean, one of the things I, I, I think often just now is that, and this might sound really strange given the struggles that women had in years gone by, the struggles women still have in many parts of the, the, the world, that in some ways it's harder today to be mm. a feminist, harder to be a woman, because, you know, sometimes it's said to me, pointing at me, a woman as first minister, we have a woman prime minister, that those battles are all won. Mm. You know, there's still things like pay gap, but those battles are on the way, hopefully, to being won. And you almost have to prove the the battles that we're still fighting, the, the cultural attitudes, yeah. the barriers women still face. So in many ways for younger women today, it's, it's more difficult. Do you, yeah. do you think that might be the case? I, yes, but you know, I think it's always been difficult. Yeah. I mean, I, I, think that, I think that parts of the world that started to tell themselves that things are fine with gender, even when they weren't. And I, I think there's a sense in which we should also start to talk about that idea that women are somehow morally better. They're not. You know, women are not special. It's, I think it's important to make that part of the feminist discourse. Women are normal, they're human, they're ordinary. And I say this because I think that there's also a judgment that, that women in, in um, positions of power, political power, mm. such as yourself, I think come under. And, and I say this as somebody who, um, I, I like to follow, I, I like to sort of read about women politicians, women, you know, the, the way that they're covered. It interests me very much because I'm always very aware of how the, the standards are never quite the same. I think that this idea that women are somehow morally better means that they're judged much more harshly. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a woman politician in Nigeria who some years ago um, was accused of having stolen quite a bit of money. And Nigerian politicians um, are you know, rather adept at things of that sort. And I remember how how harshly she was criticized and how often the criticism was sort of couched in the language of gender, it was, she's a woman, how could she? And I find that really dehumanizing. You know, I find that really dehumanizing. And, um, and you know, we can talk about the, the focus on appearance, right, that, that's often reserved for women, which for me is not even as insidious as the, as the kind of more um, 
the way that the things that a woman politician does would be judged very differently if, if a male politician did the same thing. So I do think it's, um, for younger women, I mean, I think it's so much more complicated because, because there's a, in some ways I think, you know, there's sort of the idea that, oh, things are fine. I mean, generally, people will say, oh, this isn't Saudi Arabia, right? I mean, you can drive and you can vote, so why are you complaining? And so I think because there's in some ways a greater subtlety almost to the... the mm. So sometimes you find that you're in a position to have to prove it, yeah. which I find exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. People will say to you, well, how do you know it's gender? Yeah. And... and it's easy to discount because it's not so black and white. I mean, at least not, not in certain parts of the world. I, I often say that in Nigeria, sexism is quite in your face and there's something almost refreshing about it because at least you know what you're dealing with. In Western Europe and in the US, it's layered. So then you, you're sort of dealing with a lot and um, I think then it can become more dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More, more difficult, more dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Re reading that book, I, a lot of it spoke very directly to me. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was a younger woman in politics, uh, what was very often said about me, and I used to get upset because I didn't think it was true, but that I didn't smile. Yeah. You would never hear that about a man in, yep. in politics. And yep. things in, in men that are seen as, uh, you know, leadership yep. and assertiveness. Yep. In a woman, you're bossy and strident. Yep. And, you know, the, the, the judgments are just yep. completely I remember, different. actually, I'm going to tell you when I really became a, a fierce fangirl of yours. <laughs> so I was reading Excuse us though. while we just have this mutual <laughs> appreciation society. <laughs> So I follow, you know, I sort of, I follow, I follow um, UK politics. And, and what's interesting, I, I have to, I, I admittedly don't always understand it. Neither do I. <laughs> because I read certain things, I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, certain things happen, I'm like, I don't quite, I mean, there's just a... I, I don't quite understand this, but okay. And I remember reading um, this piece about how she's too serious. And I remember feeling this rage. And I thought, what the F you seek? <laughs> I mean, why is that criticism? Exactly. Why, you know, it's, it's sort of that idea that, of course she's serious, of course she should be serious. Serious is good. Oops. <laughs> right. so I was trying not to go into one of my rants. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I remember just really feeling that, that and, and, and the people for whom um, that would be easy to brush her side and yeah. be like, well, that's not such a bad yeah. thing. But it is. It is because what it does is that the, the, the standards are not the same. Yeah. And if the standards are not the same, we don't have justice. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I know what you mean about the, the rage. I felt myself feeling that same rage watching the American election and, and watching how Hillary Clinton oh, goodness, was yes. And yes. then, you know, you, you still hear people saying it wasn't yes. because she was a woman. And of course, not everything was because she was a woman. But watching it from afar, so much of the, yep. so many of the judgments made yep. were absolutely yep. of course because were. she was a there woman. Were. And you, you find, I, I found myself being in a position of, um, and because I was a Hillary Clinton supporter, mm. but even if I hadn't been. And so for me, this talking about gender isn't really about ideology, yeah. right? Because I can disagree. I mean, I don't really buy into the sort of that idea of the sisterhood in feminism where, you know, you're supposed to support every woman. I, I don't, I'm sorry, because there's certain women I just can't support. Mm. Um, but I can think of one in the UK <laughs> politics myself at the moment. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I think what I will always do, just in principle, is, is refuse to go along with a woman being criticized because she's a woman. And you can tell, you can tell when it's ideological, which I think is fine, right? I want to rip apart the ideologies of people I don't agree with. Yeah. But to, <laughs> to criticize them in ways that you wouldn't criticize a yeah. man, I just find, and, and with Hillary Clinton, I think because I, I supported her and, and thought that she was by far the better qualified candidate, it was even more galling for me. Yeah. Um, and, but what's even more interesting is that when you have these conversations with some people, they ask you, well, prove it. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say, no, it wasn't because she's a woman. It was because, you know, cookie monster likes to eat cookies. I mean, people will pull out every imaginable reason mm -hmm. just so that it's not gender. Yeah. And I find even that very telling. But, but I also think that maybe there's something instructive in, in Hillary Clinton's... Um, in everything that happened, hopefully. I think, that when, I think that when historians look back, I think it's going to be very clear how, how much her being a woman played a role yeah. in, in, um, in what's become America's um, catastrophic present. Well, we've 
managed to take ourselves mm. seamlessly into American politics, which is not... <laughs> I, oh, we uh, could just stay with UK politics. You could explain some things to me. I, <laughs> like, what, Brexit? I can't <laughs> do that, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's inexplicable to me. Uh, I just would like to have it... I mean, really, do you... <laughs> Tables are turning here. <laughs> I'm meant to be interviewing you. Okay. <laughs> but I do want to ask you, I mean, I'm just really... When, seriously, though, when do you find time to read? Um, reading is, it is such a, an essential part of my being that I can't imagine not reading. I, I struggle to find the time to read, and mm -hmm. I don't find as much time as possible, but if I didn't read, my, my whole well-being and ability to function would suffer. So I, I try to read uh, something every day, even if it's just a few pages before I fall asleep late yeah. at night. And uh, this week I've been rereading your books oh. in advance of, which, has, which allows me to get back to interviewing <laughs> you. <laughs> but, yeah, re reading is, is, yeah. is such an essential part of, of who I am. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine life without it. Uh, but I have uh, been rereading uh, Half of a Yellow Sun this week, but one of my favourite books of all time is, is Americana. Mm. And I've always wanted to, to ask you this, so now I've got the chance. Uh, is the main character in Americana based on <laughs> you to any great extent? Maybe, maybe yeah. not. <laughs> I think, one of, I think one of the wonderful things about doing things of this sort after writing fiction is when you're writing fiction, you're not really thinking. I mean, there's a lot that's unconscious, there's a lot that's... And then afterwards, you have to invent answers to questions like this. So, so depending on my mood, I'll say, yes, it was about me. And, and other days, when I'm not in a very good mood, I'll be like, oh, no, of course not. But, but really, I think that all my characters are partly me. Um, and Ife Melo is sort of me. I mean, my friend said to me, she's you without the warmth. I thought she which, you know, I thought, hmm, because I really like her. I like her too. Yeah. And I wanted her to be, in, in some ways, I think that she was a deliberate construct on my part. I wanted, I'd become really tired of, of women writers being told that the women characters were not likable. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's something that many women writers identify with. They're often told, oh, that she's not likable. She's not, you know, you have to, you have to change her and make her likable. And I thought, it's too easy. I want people who are complex and interesting and textured, and I think that's the way people are, really. Yeah. And so I didn't want her to be easy. I wanted her to be complicated. I wanted her to, um, to make some bad choices, because we all she do. She certainly did. <laughs> make one For those who haven't read Americana, it's about a Nigerian woman living in the United States. And one of the things uh, that, that struck me, one of, of the comments you made, is that you didn't really think about race and racism until you left Nigeria and went to the United States. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wasn't black until I went yeah. to America. That's really, I really wasn't. I mean, in Nigeria, I didn't think of myself as black. I didn't need to think of myself as black. And even now, every time I go back home, because I spend, I split my time between the US and Lagos, and every time I get off the plane in, in Lagos, I don't think of race. I don't remember that I'm black. I think about many other things. <laughs> there are many other things that, become great sources of irritation for me. And in some ways, I think gender becomes even more present. Yeah. Um, in the US, I walk into a room, I'm immediately aware of how many black people are there. Yeah. Um, I'm very, and, and I've learned in the US the nuances of race. When I first went, I didn't quite get it, because again, you know, Nigeria has many problems, but, but the idea of identity being based on skin color just doesn't exist. Mm. And, and not even that, because I, I often say that it's not, the problem isn't the skin, which, you know, I adore and find glorious. But the problem is other people's um, stereotypes that they've attached to it. And so when I went to the US, for example, I remember being in a class, um, and it was an English class, and it was the first paper we had written, and the professor came back in and said, who is Adichie? The, the, the uh, Americans find it very difficult to pronounce my last name, Adichie. And so when I raised my hand, he said, this is the best paper that I've read. And he said, who is this? And I raised my hand and he looked surprised. And it was a very small fleeting moment. <coughs> but I remember that moment thinking, and I'll never forget it, because I remember thinking, this is what race means in America. He doesn't expect the person who wrote the best paper to be black. And having come from Nigeria where, you know, in Nigeria each morning we, we take a, we, we have a glass of, of um, arrogant pride for breakfast. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I remember thinking, 
how can he be surprised, right? <laughs> how dare he? But <laughs> I think there might be a Nigerian here. <laughs> yep. You know what we're like. Yeah. like yes, we're all brilliant. But, but you know, and it became a learning experience yeah. for me. And also, there's a sense in which I wanted Ifemelu's journey to mirror that, because a lot of what she experiences, I experienced as well. I mean, I, I dramatize things a bit in, in, the, in the book, but you know, that idea that you then want to separate yourself from it because you know it's negative. So for, a, for my first year in the US, I didn't want to be black. I didn't go to the Black Students' Union. because so I was like, no, I'm not black, I'm Nigerian. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I realize now, looking back, that even that is an indictment of American racism. Yeah. It was my way of, it, you know, if being black in America were benign, I would not have had that, that, um, that reaction. And then I started reading. I mean, and reading is just really my life's greatest consolation. And I read American history, I read African American history in particular, and suddenly my eyes were open. I just thought, my God, these things happened so recently, and this country seems, at least on the surface, not to be burning up. I mean, I, mean, I think the, Im the unimaginable injustices that African Americans have experienced mm. at the hands of um, the American state is something that I think hasn't really even, the story hasn't been told fully. Yes, yeah. I agree. One of the things about Americana that, uh, you know, it was uh, published, I think, just after Obama was yes. re-elected. And although, yeah, it's, it's all about the challenges and the, the, the very difficult issues that, that she faces, I, I thought there was a real sense of optimism mm. and hope mm. that ran through it, uh, perhaps mm. because of, of the Obama presidency, and mm. which takes mm. us back to you know, wh where we are now. I think f from those of, for those of us looking at the states from the outside just now, what is quite difficult, speaking personally, to, to understand is not just the election of Trump, but how a country goes yeah. from electing its first black president to Trump in such a short space yeah. of time. Yeah, but you know, I, I really think that they are connected. I think that Trump would not have happened if Obama hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a sense in which Trump is a reaction to Obama. And there's a lot of talk about the um, Obama-Trump voters, so the people who voted for Obama and who now voted for Trump. And I, I really think that there's a sense in which <laughs> the black man was allowed in the White House and suddenly they're like, ah, actually, that wasn't such a good idea. So now we're going to go to the other extreme and have this... <laughs> jingoist. So I think that there are two things that are connected. Um, I think that, that race and gender really, in some ways, explain the, mm. the, the election. And, and I see this, of course, having read a lot about the economic reasons that are ostensibly behind Trump's win. And, um, and I've spent time sort of pouring at all these studies of the, <laughs> of the electorate. And actually, many of the people who are in economic distress voted for Hillary Clinton. Um, so I think, that, 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 I think that, Ob that Trump and Obama, this, it's strange, but in some ways, if you look at America, it's not that, it's yeah. not that surprising. Um, that, that I'm, not, I'm not as surprised as some people are that there are many Obama-Trump um, voters. Yeah. I think... I think it's sort of, American history is so steeped in racism. I mean, I think it's very easy to forget that. It's so steeped in racism, and, and because I think race is the one subject that Americans still cannot really talk about honestly. It's the one subject that makes everybody very uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think because of that, it's hard to see how much it forms America, how you look at different laws and you look at their history and almost all of them have something to do with race. Mm -hmm. And so it's not really for me not that surprising. I mean, it's, it's sad and, and quite frankly, on a personal level, very worrying, mm -hmm. but it's not surprising. And, and I also don't buy the idea that Trump is somehow not America or somehow not representative of America. I have many well-meaning liberal friends who say, this is not us. Actually, it is. Trump is America. In, just as Obama was. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, here we, many of us look on in, in horror and almost disbelief at what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis, but what's it like to live there just now? I mean, it's a serious question. Does it feel different? Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. Before? It absolutely does, absolutely. I mean, which is why I think a government sets the tone, and that tone trickles down to just the most ordinary lives. And... I, um, 
coming to the U.S., coming, so when I'm in Nigeria, when I go back to the U.S., I always go back with a certain sense of, of dread. Just for the most practical things, I'm thinking I have a Nigerian passport and a U.S. green card, and I'm thinking, has he passed a crazy law, which means that somebody will tell me you can't be admitted even though you have a green card? I mean, just sort of basic practical things. But more philosophically, I think, there's a sense of um, <laughs> and it's suspicion for me, and, and really for many of my friends who are not white, who suddenly are thinking about white people around them. You know, are, are you one of them, right? Because now we don't know. You don't know who support somebody who clearly doesn't believe in the equal citizenship of people of color. And so there's a kind of, um, actually a few days after Trump won, I remember looking out the window of my, of my home in a very nice um, part of, of the state of Maryland, and suddenly going to, into a slight panic and thinking, oh my God, my neighbors voted for Trump. They probably have a gun, they're going to come shoot us. I mean, it, it was, and it was unreasonable, yeah. right? thinking about it intellectually, because I thought, of course, that's not going to happen. But having read so much and seen what was happening in America, it was a real visceral anxiety that I had. I'm happy to announce, of course, that my neighbours are all lovely people. <laughs> but that, you're, you're right, Go governments but, do set tones. Oh, they and do, absolutely. The, the anxiety that can be caused yes. if that tone is, yep. is the wrong one or a yep. threatening one or one that makes people unsafe. Yep. Let's leave Trump. Yes, let's yeah. do that. <laughs> you're, one of the things that I, I think is so utterly fascinating and engrossing about your books is just how multi-layered mm. they are. Mm. You know, your books, they cover politics, history, war, they are love stories, yes. they talk about fashion and hair and food, all <laughs> encompassed in, in, in one novel. Yep. What, 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 what's the starting point for a, a book for you? Is it, is it the, the theme? Is it the, the moment of history or the, mm. the character? It's, um, it really depends. Often it's mood. Mm. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's this kind of a monfors thing. So I, I start a book and I have a, an idea of what I want to do, but I never quite know where it's going. And, and for me, that's the pleasure, because if I, if I knew the endings of my, of my books, then I wouldn't want to write them. Mm. So that for me, the journey is the pleasure. And just when it's going well, I, it makes me so happy. I feel transported. I'm, I'm, and that's uh, when my writing is going well, those are the, the few times when I'm actually quite fun to be around. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't happen often enough, sadly. But it, so it really, it really depends. But I think it's really just that I'm interested in people. I think that some writers who are more interested in ideas than in people, and you know, who, whose work I will read and find interesting. But I, I think that fiction functions best when it can make us connect on a human level. And, and it's impossible to think of human beings if we don't think about the totality of them, which is why, for example, I think our talking about shoes is as important as talking about Brexit. Hmm. It's certainly more pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um. But it, it strikes me, ha half of a yellow sun must have been, I, I don't know, but you know, your, your family, I, I know, were involved yeah. in the Biafran yeah. war. Yeah. Uh, you, lost, both your grandfathers uh, died there. It must have been an intensely personal very. novel. It to was. have have written it was very very personal did it you was. always want to to write <laughs> i did i i you know i was the child who was haunted by our history mm -hmm. i was and i and i i think that most families have that one child who want to know what their story is and and as a child and so it's hard for me to explain where it came from i was just always haunted by our past and my father talked so much about his father who my father describes my grandfather as a fiercely moral man which is a description I've always loved. And so it really, for me, was about trying to understand this thing, this phenomenon that had taken my grandfathers and that had really shaped my parents' lives. My parents lost everything they had. And, um, but at the same time, they believed very much in this cause. And, and for me, it was important to try and capture that, that people, and in some ways for me as a Nigerian today in, in a country that I think sadly is lacking in any kind of real ideological positions. The idea of, of believing in a cause, in something that isn't just about, you know, how do we share the revenue among the states? For me, it's just really, um, I don't know, inspiring. Right? I agree. Yeah, it's inspiring. I agree. But <laughs> oh, I just realized that there might be parallels to draw here, which was not intended, but. Yeah, there, there, there are some differences <laughs> as well, it's fair to say. But 
I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan of historical fiction. It's mm. one, of, one of my favourite genres. And I often wonder, people who write historical fiction, how, how true you feel you have a responsibility mm. to be, obviously, mm. true to the generality of the, mm. the story, but to the detail of mm. it. Do you feel you have to stay absolutely true to that or do you have some flexibility? I'm kind of quite conservative about that. I think that it's important to stay true to things. If you're going to write, I mean, it's not fantasy. You're you. So I do think it's important. And, and for me in particular, Half of the Yellow Sun, I knew for many people would not just be literature, it would be history. Yeah. And my generation of Nigerians, because Nigeria, like, like you know, really all countries, buries the parts of its past that it's uncomfortable about. And so we didn't really learn very much about Biafra when I was in school. And so I really wanted to get the facts right because I knew that many of my generation would read that and, and for them it would be history. And, and so I find that when I do read um, novels that are historical and if something is off, I, I get intensely irritated. <laughs> Because I, and, and I feel that way also about historical films, because I think, why do you need to make something up? The truth is actually very interesting. Mm -hmm. What did yeah. you think of the film of Half of a Yellow Sun? I thought it was a good film. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that um, B, who's, who's the, who, who made the film, who's also a friend of mine, in some ways the film was different from the book. And I remember, and I wasn't part of it, I, w I, didn't, I chose not to be involved, after having one conversation with B in which he said, that Ubu, the main character in the novel, would not be the main focus of the mm. film. And I just thought, no. Mm. And I was like, Ubu is the soul. And he said, no, Ubu won't walk on screen. And at that point, I stepped back mm. because I thought, I'm not a filmmaker. I don't know how films walk. <laughs> right. um, but I also think that it's, it's a novel that maybe actually would have been better served as a miniseries. I think it's really difficult to compress Mm -hmm. a novel like that into a two-hour feature yeah. film. I, I've not seen the film, so I, mm. I, I, I've, I've, I, I don't really enjoy seeing films of books mm. I, I love because I, mm. I never think they live up to, to the book. But I've got one more question before I'm going to open uh, up to our wonderful audience here. One of the, the pieces of advice you give your friend on raising her daughter is teach her to love books and, and mm. reading. Mm. Uh, what, what books do, did you like reading? What books do you like reading? What writers do you, you love? Oh, there's so many. I, I really, when I was growing up, I read everything. I, I was a child who, um, my father's a professor of statistics, so we really didn't have that many sort of um, novels in the house. <laughs> so I read everything that I could understand mm -hmm. in my father's <laughs> library, which, which meant I would sort of, you know, I couldn't, of course, understand the annals of statistics, but I could understand my father had um, books on, on, on the history of the Roman Catholic Church, and I read that when I was nine. So at the age of 11, I was, I was, you know, that very annoying child who in school would lecture her friends about things that her friends knew nothing about. So I would tell them about Vatican II. <laughs> at nine years old? Yes. <laughs> I look back now and I, I, can't, I, I don't know how they tolerated me. It's, it's just ridiculous. But I, and now as an adult, I find actually, you know, I, what I miss is there's a kind of the ability to absolutely be absorbed in books that I, I think I've lost a little. Yeah, I know what you mean. When I was, when I was younger, I could just, I, I could disappear in books for, for just long stretches of time. Now, I don't know if, if it's because I, I live part of the year in the U.S. and I have now been tainted by that thing called the uh, short attention span which seems to be an American affliction. But, uh, and I don't know why, but now I read four books at the same time. And I, so I read, I really read, every, I, I read everything. I, I find that I'm partial to a certain kind of realistic fiction that does psychology and mm -hmm. humor, you know, the, the kind that you read and you sort of feel like you know the character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I also, and I love stories, so I don't mean, I mean, I find that whenever books are described as meditations, I'm a little wary. Mm. <laughs> But, but there's some that I've read and loved, but, you know, in general, um, <laughs> I also like, I like, um, I, I read a lot of nonfiction, increasingly. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like to read history. Um, I, I think I read everything. It's hard to, I mean, right now, the, the writers that I'm loving, I'm rereading a lot of Rebecca West, mm -hmm. who I just adore, and I'm also reading a, a biography of hers. I, I find that I find comfort in reading about unusual women, mm -hmm. because it makes me feel um, <laughs> less alone. <laughs> Oh, strange women. And just knowing that there are women who've chosen to live their lives in ways that weren't considered conventional, I, I just find really comforting. So I, I rereading her, I just really love her. And also um, a book that I, I 
deeply love is um, Elizabeth Hardwick's um, Sleepless Nights. Mm -hmm. I, um, Chino Achebe is the writer who's very important to me. He gave me permission to write. I mean, he is, I just adore him. But there's so much I love. I mean, I, I think maybe actually what I don't love, I, I think it will be a smaller pile, which would be fantasy, hmm. science fiction. I mean, God bless those genres. I, I know that they're, <laughs> and, and you know, like a friend of mine said to me once, she said, you know, they don't need you because they have many, many readers. So. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's hear it for strange, unconventional <laughs> women. Um, OK, we're going to take a few questions from, from our audience. Uh, now, I will try to uh, be fair uh, to, to all parts of the room. Um, did I see a hand just, just here? Uh, hi, I'm a psychologist and I am very interested in resilience and helping young people build psychological resilience, particularly about like dealing with setback because you, all of us will have a lot of setbacks in life. Mm. I'm just wondering what's your experience of resilience, what you consider as the most important thing um, or important message to young people about building this uh, psychological resilience? I think, I think you would be more suited. <laughs> It's a, very, it's a very good question. I mean, I, in, in politics, as in many other walks of life, uh, you, you have to learn to be very resilient, uh, both because you get knockbacks all the time. I mean, I lost many, many elections before I first won an election. And so you learn to uh, not go away, <laughs> even though some people might wish you did, um, and come back and learn from experiences. I think the most important thing is to try to learn from failure, um, not be as afraid of failure not not but see it as part of of, of your learning um so that would be the, the most important advice uh, I, I i would give to to anybody around resilience mm. how close do you come to giving in to failure um you have your moments of self-doubt and yeah. uh, and moments of thinking do i really want to to do this anymore but they're very they're few and far between yeah. um, because you know the position i'm in now is such a privilege that the good bits vastly outweigh yeah. the bad bits. But over the years, yeah, you, you, you find moments where your, your confidence in yourself is, is yeah. perhaps quite low, and those are really difficult moments. And you've got to draw on experience. I think that gets easier as you get older because you've yes. got more of a well of experience to draw on. I, you know, no, I just can't help but agree very um, enthusiastically about how we, I think it gets easy and better for women as they get yeah. older. I mean, in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. the, the, I mean, you might have to start thinking about things like eye cream, but, <laughs> but, but just in, in more sort of substantive ways, I, I think that as I'm going to be 40 in a few weeks, actually. <laughs> and You're not about to get any sympathy from me right now, OK? <laughs> well, I feel... Well... And I, they've I, done that. <laughs> but really, I, I do feel that it, it gets... Um, your skin starts to feel like your own, and you, you start to... Um, you just realize that you look in the bag of Fox to give, and it's empty. <laughs> it's empty. Right? And, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I have to apologize to the elderly in the room who probably don't know what the hell I'm talking about. But in terms of resilience, I, I think, um, I don't even know. I, I, I do think, though, that it's important to let young people know that life is not going to, that difficult is a part of life, that you will fall down at some point. Right? And, and I say that because I think increasingly, while I, I think it's, it's wonderful that children now are being raised with a sense of self-esteem and all of that, it, it's easy to overdo it. And, and sometimes I'm observing the U.S. and I think, you know, maybe you shouldn't give the child an A for effort, right? Maybe effort should be seen as ordinary. And, and I think that when you do that to a child consistently, it, they, they don't have resilience. So suddenly when something comes in their way, they don't know how to navigate it. Um, and when I, I know that in my childhood when I was growing up, I certainly didn't get an A for effort. I, I grew up in a very loving, very happy childhood, but a very happy home. But, I, you know, I didn't, um, yeah, I, di I didn't get a star for, for effort. I, I got a star when I actually did well. And when I didn't, I remember my father would say to me, never mind, you can do better. <laughs> and, you know, so he didn't say to me, no, but it's great that you, you know, he'd just be like, well, this wasn't good, but hey, you can do better. And, and I find that that, at least for me, it helped me. And I, and I find that I, you know, there's, there's quite a bit I can 
weather. But then also I have moments when I just crawl into bed and eat ice cream and feel sorry for myself. <laughs> yeah, yes. And I think it's important to make room for that as well, because I think it's so dishonest to pretend that we're always strong. Nobody's always strong. And, and I think it's important for women to sort of make room for themselves to feel that, you know, I, I hate self-pity, but sometimes I give into it. And, and, you know, I know this sounds very perverse, but being famous affords you many opportunities for self-pity. <laughs> <laughs> so I generally give in about once in four months. That's not bad. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, obviously I, I know politics better than I know anything else, but it's, it's one of the things that's very difficult about politics and probably more difficult for women yeah. is that it's not okay yes. to admit vulnerability. Yes. It's not okay to yes. admit doubt or weakness about yes. anything. And actually, I think politics might be a lot better if, if we were a lot Oh, absolutely. I think that. it would we be a lot better. We don't know at all. Yeah. For men and women, yeah. right? For men and women. Because in some ways, if men do, we kind of praise them, don't yeah. we? If women do, we're like, hmm, mm -hmm. maybe she's not qualified. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then if she doesn't, then she's too serious. It's like, what the... F <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, you've given me a great quote for the next time I'm being harangued in an interview. I'm looking into the bag. <laughs> right, next question. Who, uh, up the back here. Um, hi. Hello. Um, uh, one thing when I was reading Americana that really stood out to me was, um, and I don't want to like butcher her name, but a fem I can't say it, I'm sorry. It's close. But her attitude towards mental health and how she believed that like she couldn't have mental health because it was like for white people and things. And I was just wondering, do you feel that attitudes to one, towards mental health in Nigeria are improving, and what could be done to to improve them in countries like Nigeria? That's a good question. Yes, I mean, I, I think that's very perceptive because in some ways, I, it was deliberate. I, I, was, I wanted that to start a conversation. I wanted to... Um, I, I find ways in my fiction to sneak in a little bit of preachiness whenever I can. <laughs> and mental health, depression in particular, is something I feel very strongly about. Mostly because I suffer from depression. And I think it's important to, to demystify it. I think particularly for people who are creative, it's such a part of life. And, and in Nigeria, there is no space to talk about that. There's no language for it. And people will dismiss it as, oh, that's what happens to white people. And, you know, people say that, but then you're looking around and you realize, you know, one in every five Nigerians walking the streets, clearly, it needs, to, needs help. And um, so, yes, um, I, I think it's changing ever so slightly. I, I, um, I, I teach a workshop in Lagos every year, and, and every year now, in the past few years, I, I have a section on talking about depression, where I'm like, let's just let our hair down and just know that it's normal and that, it's, that you know, asking for help, seeking help, doesn't make you weak. Actually, actually, it's a sign of strength. Um, wanting to be better. So I think it's changing slightly, but I think it's not just Nigeria, though. I think that there is, in general, a stigma attached to, to mental health issues everywhere. Um, I'm going to guess, without having read much about mental health in Scotland, that that is probably true here, too. And, and I think it's important to demystify it. You know, I think it's important to, to make it ordinary, because that's the way people will get help. And, and again, in many ways, like feminism, we'll be happier <laughs> if um, mental health were seen as normal and if people who seem um you know if people sort of spoke about it more so i was hoping to do that with america and i, I think it, it did happen a bit I, I think that there are people who had conversations about it because of the book so that made me happy okay uh gentlemen over here I was in Nigeria between 1959 and 1966 and had a marvelous time there. Uh, my question is, during that time, there were very few female politicians. Has the system changed? No. <laughs> I, I, I also have to say that it's, it's um, both surprising and refreshing to, to hear marvelous in Nigeria in the same sentence coming from, <laughs> from a foreigner. That usually doesn't happen, so... Where in Nigeria were you? Ibadan. Oh, in Ibadan. Ah. At the university? Yeah, the hospital. Ah. It, it, it's, 
I mean, 1960, it's changed a bit. It has changed. What, what I would like to see more of, I think, is, is more, we don't have, a, we don't have any woman, who, we don't have a female governor. And the way that, Niger that Nigerian, um, the political structure in Nigeria means that governors have immense power. Governors are like little feudal lords. And I think it's important for women to, to, to get in there. And, and I think it's, it's a kind of um, space that's fiercely protected by maleness. Um, so senators, the, the s we've had women senators. We haven't had a woman governor. Um, I think things are changing a little, not, not fast enough, for, for in my opinion. And I, I think there's something just egregious that we still have, which is something called the women's wing of political parties, which I just find ridiculous because, yeah. <laughs> Do you ever see a, a future for yourself in politics? No. no? <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, anybody over, over here? I, you know, I admire politicians because it must, it must take a lot. It's dreadful. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I mean, because in some ways you find that there are situations in which you want to be your, your genuine self, but you can't. That, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful, yeah. wonderful thing to do. And please uh, don't, don't take uh, what I'm about to say as to mean anything else. But I suppose if there is a frustrating at times thing about it is that you you can always say what you think yeah. and you can always speak yeah. your mind. And yeah. uh, because if you do, then there will, as there probably are this evening, journalists sitting ready to yes. misrepresent yes. or, or oversimplify yes. what you've said. Yep. Uh, so that means you end up self-censoring yep. a lot of the time yep. and, and that can be quite difficult. And you know, I remember observing Hillary Clinton and thinking, my God, she is, I mean, because people who know her talk about how she's, she's such an interesting person. But watching her, I remember thinking she, the self-censorship yeah. was so acute. And I, and I think a lot of it was because she was a woman, but also it was because she was so much aware of how being a politician, she can't be too aggressive because then she's, but she can't be too soft because then, and she can't be too, and so suddenly she just becomes a robot. Exactly. Sometimes I you feel you, you can't win. You, you're damned if you yep. do, yep. damned if, yep. if you don't. Although there are some politicians for whom self-censorship may be a good thing. This is um, true. Yes, gentlemen at the, the back. Do we have a, a microphone? Uh, oh, right, sorry. If we, somebody got a microphone over here. My apologies, I'll go over here. Hello, Hello. my name's Grace. And I have a question about being a writer because I'm a very young girl and I write a lot of books that I share with my family. But like, I don't know how to like make them more interesting. <laughs> you just have to keep trying. <laughs> you know, when I, how old are you? 11. Oh, wow. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Because so, I started very young as well. When I was, my mother, when I was six, I was doing these little chapbooks for my mother and she kept them. So you're 11, you have a lot of time. <laughs> and writing, writing is really, writing is both inspiration and craft. So you, you have to keep at it. You have to keep at it. You have to you know, just keep at it and keep reading. You have to read as well. And, and if you keep at it, it will get more interesting. Keep at it, believe in yourself, and one day you'll be sitting up here. <laughs> um, OK, we've got time for one, one last question up here. Oh, sorry. Well, listen, we'll take both of them quickly. If you can ask your question quickly, and then this one, and... Right. Jamanda, you made the uh, biopra famous in your book, Half a Hero's Son, and I read history more out of circumstance than by choice. I suppose... Writers in the past 30, 40, 50 years have been very selective in uh, choosing the historical events, and therefore there's a risk of a lot of pro prominent historical events fading into oblivion. Mm. Do you agree with that, and why is that the case? Do I believe that? Yeah. Do you agree with me? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, sort of. No, I think history, I mean, and the thing about it, it's I don't think we can talk about history without talking about the fact that history itself is politicized. I mean, what stories get told and how they get told. And I think in some ways it's playing out now, um, politically in the world, in the US, the, 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 what is ostensibly a fight about statues 
is really a fight about how history has been told and how history is, is being celebrated or not and what the stories have been. That's really what it's about. So yes, I mean, I, I think that is true, which is why I think it's so important for, for these stories to be told and particularly from certain perspectives. Right? I, um, I think Biafra, for example, there's still many stories to be told. There is still, of course, the Nigerian side of, of, this, of, um, of, of the war which in itself is a story that should be told, I think. So, so I suppose that's a roundabout way of saying, yes, I agree with you. Why is that? Because storytelling is always about power. Hmm. Okay, I, I'm going to, I, I'm at risk of getting into trouble for overrunning here, but I did promise uh, somebody up here, so if you can be as brief as possible. I'll try to be really quick. Um, uh, I want to touch on something that you talked about um, regarding racism in America. Um, and for me, what was what was the most scary wasn't that we had Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan members and Nazis um, running around um, in plain sight in Virginia. It was the response over here in Britain was that, oh, well, it's their problem over there. How terrible. And people over here are still really bad at engaging with the fact that we do have white supremacy in Scotland, in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, we have the very charming Scottish Defence League parading around Edinburgh, for example. So my question is, um, what do the both of you do to uh, engage with and promote anti-racism in your feminism? Well, f firstly, to, to call it out wherever uh, and whenever you find it. I, I don't think we should be complacent about uh, circumstances in our own country. Um, I do think overall Scotland is a, a welcoming, tolerant place that celebrates diversity, but that's not to say there aren't racists among us and we must call it out. And we must call it out you know, internationally. I've you know, had some criticism as First Minister for being so uh, explicit in my criticism of Donald Trump, but there are some things that are so fundamental <laughs> human values Bravo. that you can't have a diplomatic silence Bravo. about them. Um, yep. And that yep. 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 I, mean, I, 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 you know, I've always enjoyed going to different countries and observing the, um, the ways that the local manifestation of racism. <laughs> it's just always interesting to me. And also observing the ways in which people tell themselves stories about how the racism it really isn't there. Um, and I remember in Germany, where because of their history, which is very interesting, that even the language isn't there. So you can't say race because of the history. And so there are a lot of black Germans who were in the audience at my event and they were just furious because they said, you know, we can't talk about our experiences. And the liberal white Germans said, but there's no racism in Germany. Um, so it was really fun for me. No, um, <laughs> I, look, I think, I think that, um, I, think, I think racism is, is a part of, I mean, again, because if you go back in history, you know, the racism, that, that colonialism happened, it was justified by, by racism. And so racism was created to justify colonialism. And, and all of the countries that have benefited from colonialism, the United Kingdom being one, of course, they, they, I mean, of course there has to be racism, right? For me, it's about having the language to talk about it, but I think mostly it's also giving room to people who suffer racism to be able to articulate their experiences and not to tell them that it's not race, but it's Cookie Monster or it's the sun or it's the moon. Or, you know, I find that that happens quite a bit. And, and in some ways, I think people just want to be heard. I think people want to be heard and, and that people want their experiences to be taken into account. And so um, when I become Nicola's um, unofficial advisor, um, <laughs> We're going to set up a. We're going to set up a storytelling yacht where <laughs> Scottish people of Black and Asian um, descent will have conversations with their white brothers and sisters and tell them the things they need to stop doing. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Well, I'm sure I speak for everybody here when I say I, I could go on listening to you for the rest of the evening and well into tomorrow. It's been a huge privilege to have you and with for us, me, Chimamanda. Such an honour to share a stage huge. with you. Really. Let's give it up for Chimamanda. <laughs> and Thank you. Thank you.